Set the ark of the covenant where the most high dwell, and only the high priest could enter therein to offer a sacrifice for atonement of sin. But the veil was rent in an instant. Revealing that holy place For on a hill nearby On a rugged cross Justice led grace I can go Into the holy of holies I can kneel And make Petitions no I can go into the holy of holies and although I'm just a common man because of God's redemption plan I can boldly approach the throne the blood of sacrifices is no more required for the blood of Christ the spotless lamb has already paid the price in the sacrifice of worship will open heaven's door allowing us to enter in the presence of Make my petitions known. I can go into the holy of holies. And although I'm just a common man, because of God's redemption plan, I can boldly approach the throne. straight to the front. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be here today together as saints of God and fellowship together and worship you. And Father, we just give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. It's not about me. It's not about anybody in here. It's all about you. And I pray that this message will glorify you, Father. And I just give you praise, honor, and glory right now in Jesus' name, my Lord, my Savior, my God. Amen. Amen. Uh, today we're going to talk about faith. So, what is faith? It tells us in Hebrew 11 
1 and 2, that faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality, faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. For by this kind of faith, the men of old gained divine approval. So, to me, I see expectancy. Faith and expectancy should work hand in hand. So, when we walk by faith, we should be expecting something. We should want our expectancies met. Because if you ask God for a healing, you're expecting that healing. So expectancies and faith walk hand in hand. So uh, it's my faith that's going to cause something to manifest itself. That healing I'm asking for. My faith even though God is going to work it out through my faith, it's going to cause that healing to manifest itself. And I like to say, somebody said this, I, I really like this, that when I ask things now of the Lord, I ask the Lord to let those things manifest. If it's a healing, I ask him to let those things manifest in my body while I'm still in it. You know, I want it to, to manifest itself while I'm still in the body, you know, I don't want to be absent from the body, you know, I want to be absent from the body present with the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? So I would say that faith is an essential element in our Christian walk. So without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. The Bible tells us that in Hebrew. So pleasing God is or pleasing God should be the goal of each and every one of us as Christians. We should be trying to please God in every way possible. And we should be seeking God by faith. We should be walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Pastor Bob tells us that all the time. Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Because the Bible says in Romans that those who walk in the flesh, you can't please God. So, if we're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit, who are we pleasing? We're pleasing ourselves, and we're pleasing Satan. We're really pleasing Satan when we walk in the flesh. So, anytime we walk in the flesh, we are pleasing Satan. So, some days when I'm at home, I practice walking in the spirit in my house. You can do that. I practice on walking in the spirit in my home. So because if I continue to practice walking in the spirit in my home, when I leave the house, I can walk in the spirit out there in the world. Practice makes perfect. You know, so let's just take a, an example. A basketball player. A basketball player don't practice during the game. No, he practices before the game. So when it comes to us as Christians, the game is out there in the world. So we need to practice walking in the spirit before we get into the game. A lot of times, we put our faith in our resources instead of putting our faith in the source. God is the source of our faith through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Faith is a, is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's not a movement. Because movement, they stop. They cease. Look at this watch right here. 
that second hand is going round and round and round. Let that battery die. That movement is going to stop. That's why faith is a lifestyle. It's not a movement. I notice that every time something bad happens in our country, we have a movement. But as soon as the dust settles, we go right back to where we were. Faith ain't like that. Faith is eternal. So I want to practice my faith until the coming of the Lord. Because God said he would do a good work in me and you until the coming of the Lord. So we need to stay in faith until his coming or whenever the Lord decides to take us home. The Bible tells us that as a Christian, we are saved by faith. Would you put up Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9? We are saved by faith. Amplify, please, yes. It says, for it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ or drawing us to Christ, that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law so that no one would be able to boast and take credit in any way for his salvation. Mm. And this scripture makes it very clear to me that faith is a gift from God. It's a gift from the Almighty God because we don't deserve faith. Not because we've earned it. We haven't earned it. And surely not because we are worthy to have it. We're not even worthy of it. But it's a gift from God. Because it's not from me and it's not from you. It's from God. It's not obtained by our power or by our will. Because we don't have any power. The only power that we have is from God. If he didn't give us the power, we wouldn't have any. Well, let me rephrase that. Yeah, we got a little power. We got the power to mess our lives up. But the real, true, saving faith comes from God. It's a gift from God. Faith is uh, simply given to us by God, along with his grace and mercy, according to his holy plan and purpose. And because of that reason alone, just because of that alone, he deserves all the glory. Amen? Amen. So as Christians, we are to walk or live by faith. Put up 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, please. We are to walk or live by faith. So then, being always filled with good courage and confident hope, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight, living our lives in a manner consistent with our confident belief in God's promises. So, what is Paul trying to tell us? He's reminding us that as followers of Christ, that we are not to build our lives around the things that have no eternal significance. The things that we see. They have no eternal significance. My car, no eternal significance. The little money that I might have in my pocket, no eternal significance. The house that we live in, no eternal significance. In other words, we are not to pursue the things of the world as the world pursues things. We are, as Christians, we are not supposed to pursue those things, pursue those things because the world is living by sight. They're not living by faith. They're living by sight. 
But we, sh we should have our focus on those unseen realities, those like Jesus, like heaven. That's where our focus should be. And Paul goes on to say that whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. To please him. Because one thing is for certain. I think it was spoken about this morning. We've all got to appear at that judgment seat of Christ. Each and every one of us. So each and every one of us can receive what we did in this body. But our rewards. This is not because of, of, of we're not being there because of heaven and hell. It had nothing to do with heaven and hell. It it's, has to do with our rewards. Because we're still going to go to heaven because we believed in the gospel in a nutshell. We're still going to heaven. We, we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We believe that he was buried. We believe that he rose on the third day. We believe that he ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand side of the Father. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And if we believe that, we still go into heaven. Now, anybody can say what I just said. But do you believe it? You got to believe it. Not here. But it's got to drop down into here. And get into your spirit. So if you believe what I just said, you're on your way. Because whether, whatever we do apart from faith is described as sin. Romans 14, 23, please. But he who is uncertain about eating a particular thing is condemned if he eats because he is not acting from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Whatever is done with doubt is sinful. But it's important for us to realize that there are different kinds of faith with an emphasis upon the faith which works as saving the soul. Now, the scripture says, what benefit what is the benefit, my fellow believers? Wait a minute, hold on, I'm sorry. Put up James 2, 14 through 26. We're going to go to James. Now, this is where my message really is coming from, from James. What is the benefit, my fellow believers? If someone claims to have faith, but has no good works as evidence, can that kind of faith save him? No, a mere claim of faith is not sufficient. Genuine faith produces good works. If a brother or sister is without adequate clothing and lacks enough food for each day, and one of you says to them, go in peace with my blessing, keep warm and feed yourself, but he doesn't give them the necessities for the body, what good does that do? Verse 17, so to faith, it does not have works. It, to back it up, is by itself dead, inoperative and, effect, and ineffective. But someone may say, you claim to have faith, and I have good works. Show me your alleged faith without the works. If you can, and I will show you my faith by my works, that is by what I do. You believe that God is one, you do well to believe that. The demons also believe that and shudder and bristle in awe and terror. They have seen his wrath. But, you, but are you willing to recognize you foolish, spiritually shallow person that faith without good works is useless. Was our father Abraham not shown to be justified by works of obedience which expressed his faith when he offered Isaac his son on the altar as a sacrifice to God? You see that his faith was working together with his works and as a result of the works, his faith was completed reaching its maturity 
when he expressed his faith through obedience. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God. And this faith was credited to him by God as righteousness, as a con conformity to his will. And he was called a friend of God. You see a man that, you see that a man believer is justified by works and not by faith alone. That is, by acts of obedience, a born again believer reveals his faith. In the same way was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works too. When she received the Hebrew spies as guests and protected them and sent them away to escape by different, a different route. For just as the human body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works of obedience is also dead. Now, this is where my message is coming from. Now, we're going to begin with verse 14 through 17. And we're going to notice the first, the first type of faith. And we're going to call this type of faith dead faith. So, verse 14 through 17. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Now, we'll stop right there with that one. Now, go ahead to the next verse. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily foods, next verse, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Now, this is, we're talking about dead faith. So in this, these few verses here, we substitute sometimes words for deeds. Let's consider this example. Go in peace with my blessing, keep warm and feed yourself. Isn't that substituting words for deeds? Yes, it's substituting words for deeds. Go and keep warm. Feed yourself. No. Give them some clothes. Give them some food. Then send them on with, with your blessing. That's faith and works joined together. So people with this kind of faith know the uh, correct vocabulary for prayer and sound doctrine. They even quote the right verses from the Bible. But the bottom line is this. Their walk is not merging up with the talk. It's only an intellectual faith. In a person's mind, he or she knows the doctrine of salvation, but they have really not submitted themselves to God. They have really not trusted in Jesus for their salvation. They know the right words, but they don't back their words up with their works. You got to put the two together. Now, if you and I have this type of faith, let me ask the question, do we have this type of faith? No. I know each and every one of you. You don't have that type of faith. You don't have dead faith. Three times in this whole passage, James emphasized faith without works is dead. In verse 17, verse 20, and in verse 26. Any declaration of faith that does not result in a changed life or good works is a false de declaration. It ain't real. It's dead faith. Dead faith is counterfeit faith. And it can lead to false confidence. It can lead to false confidence of eternal life. Do you and I have this type of faith? We do if we if our walk don't measure up to the top. We do if our works don't measure up to our words. So how do we know it? Pastor says this all the time. By seeing yourself in the message. 
Pastor can be preaching. Willie can be preaching. Chuck, Frank, whoever. In Sunday school. Phil, I see myself in the message. So when Willie first started preaching, I said, what is this dude talking about me for? He don't even know me. <laughs> you know, but that's how the word of God is. Michelle, I really see myself in the message. You know, but that's what we are supposed to do, see ourselves in the message. That's in the message, that's how we know if we're walking in faith or not. I hear the pastor say some time ago that no man can come to Christ in faith and remain the same. Just like no man can come in contact with a 220 volt electrical wire and remain the same. <laughs> you know, and that makes a lot of sense, you know. Uh, in other words, if you stick your finger in that electricity right over there, you're not going to remain the same. <laughs> your hair going to be standing up, it's going to be smoking, you know, and, and, and you're probably going to lose your life because that 120 grabs you and holds you. It ain't a 440. You know, so, I mean, it's just, just the same thing with Christ. Once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not going to remain the same. You can't. It's impossible. Amen. It kind of agrees with 1 John 5, 12, which says, He who has the Son, by accepting him as Lord and Savior, has the life that is eternal. He who does not have the Son, by his personal faith, does not have the life. Jesus Christ is life, everlasting life, eternal life. And I know each and every one of you is in Christ. I know that. So you got the life. Now, we're going to go to the next type of faith. And we're going to come out of verses 18 and 19. We're going to call this Demonic faith. Y'all don't be shocked by that. <laughs> no, keep your socks on, you know. But, but James reminds us that demons have a type of faith. They believe in God. They even believe in the deity of Christ. It says in, you don't have to put this one up, in Mark 3, 11, verse 12, that whenever, whenever uh, the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and screamed out, you are the son of God. Jesus sternly warned them again and again not to tell who he was. They knew who he was. That's why it came out of, they, they, they said what they said. But Jesus told them not to be quiet. And I used to wonder, and I still do sometimes, uh, why Jesus didn't want those demons to tell who he was. I mean, there could be a lot of reasons. I know there, there are a lot of reasons why he didn't want them to know who he was. But he wouldn't allow those demons to speak. He told them, shut up, you know. Keep your mouth closed. First of all, the Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. It says that in John and it says that in Genesis. Now, I probably can see why Jesus didn't want those demons to speak because he didn't want any type of testimony from a sinister and lying spirit. And if Satan is the father of lies, those demons got to have the same character as Satan. So Jesus didn't want them to speak. He didn't want his identity to come from a lying source. Also, we got to keep in mind that some of the Jewish leaders back in those days, they associated Jesus with Beelzebub. And Beelzebub was the prince of the demons. So 
allowing testimony from lying spirits might have added fuel to that fire that the Jews already believed that he was, they compared him to Beelzebub, and, and, and that, would, that was a false claim. So, you know, you can put that on the shelf, and Pastor says, you know, I, it's just something, food for thought, you know. They also believe in the existence of a place of condemnation. Luke, don't, you don't have to put this one up, 830 through 31 says, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he answered, Legion, because many demons had entered him. They continually begged him not to command them to go into the abyss. So right there, they believe in a place of condemnation. The abyss, the bottomless pit, or it's a, it's a chasm, the underworld, or hell. They knew who Jesus was. And they also believe that Jesus is going to be their judge. Matthew 8, 28 and 29 says, when he arrived at the other side of the country of the Gardenus, two demon-possessed men coming out of the tomb met him. They, also extreme, they were so extremely fierce and violent that no one could pass by that way. And they screamed out, what business do we have in common with each other, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the appointed time of judgment? They knew he was going to be the judge. Think about it. Think about this. These are demons. These are demons who believe. And these demons aren't even made in the image of God, but they believe. We are people made in the God's image, and there are people out there that don't believe. Demons believe, and there are people that don't believe. That mess you up right there. <laughs> so what kind of faith do demons have? Well, we saw the man that had dead faith, which was touched only by the intellect. The demons are touched also in their emotions. Now, remember, put up verse uh, James 2.19. It says here, you believe that God is one. You do well to believe that. The demons also believe that and shudder and bristle in all filled terror. They have seen his wrath. Wow. Think about this. They say you walking. You mind your own business. You turn the corner. And as soon as you turn that corner, you walk face to face with a lion. I think you're going to be in terror. You're going to be all shook up. You come face to face with a lion. What you going to do? Can't outrun him. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> well, you shudder in fear. Well, that's what the demons do when they're in the presence of the Lord. They shudder in fear. So in my mind, they must be shuddering in fear all the time, 24-7. Because the Lord's everywhere. Ain't nowhere we, we can't get away from him. How they gonna get away from him? So they must be in fear 24-7. Now, this type of faith is one step above dead faith. It involves both the intellect and the emotions. Now the question becomes, can this kind of demonic faith save? Nope. 
A person can be enlightened in their mind and even stir it in their heart, but still be lost forever. For the simple reason that they don't believe in Christ. For the simple reason that they have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They can be lost forever. Now, true saving faith, it involves something, something more. It involves something that can be seen. It involves something that can be recognized. What is it? A changed life. A changed life. Put 18 back up, Rick. But someone may say, you claim to have faith, and I have good works. Show me your alleged faith without the works, if you can, and I will show you my faith by my works, that is, by what I do. By what I do. By what you do. Have you prayed for somebody lately? Have you helped somebody in a bad situation lately? Have you cut your neighbor's grass lately? Those are good works. Those are good works. And a good example to me of good works just happened to me recently. I went out of town recently. But Pastor Bob and Frank, they cut this grass. Those are examples of good works. They didn't do it for me. They did it for the Lord because they knew I was doing it for the Lord. I don't cut that grass for y'all. I cut that grass for the Lord. Those are good works that they did to help me out. And I appreciate that. But being a Christian involves trusting Christ and living for Christ. And I know you guys are doing that. But some people might ask, what do I get for living for Christ? Or what do you do when you're living for Christ? Well, first of all, what you get is you receive the life. That's what you get. And then you reveal the life that you have received. That's what you do. We no longer live, but we allow Christ to live through us. So now the question becomes, do we have this type of faith, that demonic faith? Well, we do if we just believe the portions of the Bible that we want to believe. My thing is this, that's the wrong answer. If you, really, if, you, if you read the Bible from the beginning to the end, you got to believe from the beginning to the end. From the beginning and everything in between to the end. You just can't pick out certain verses that you believe. It don't work that way. You got to believe, what do they say in court? You, you're going to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? You got to believe the whole truth and nothing but the whole truth. And we have that type of faith if we don't mix our works with our faith. They go hand in hand. James has introduced us to Two types of faith, and neither one of those faith can save us. Neither one. Dead faith involving the intellect alone, and demonic faith involving the intellect and the emotions. But it stops right there. It stops right there. So he closes out the section by describing in verses 20 through 26, the only kind of faith that can save. And we're going to call this faith dynamic faith. So, dynamic faith. What kind of faith is this? Well, we know from the passages 
that dynamic faith is based on the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing what is told and what is heard comes by the preaching of the message concerning Christ. Now, dynamic faith, it involves the whole man. The whole man. Let's review. Dead faith touches the intellect. Demonic faith involves both the mind and the emotions. But dynamic faith involves the intellect, the emotions, and the will. So, how does it work? Well, the mind understands the truth. The heart desires and the rejoices in the truth that the mind understands. And the will acts upon that truth. Okay? So true saving faith leads to what? Action. It leads to action. It's not intellectual contemplation. It's not emotionalism. It is that which leads to obedience in doing good works. Obedience in doing good works. Now, to illustrate James, he referred to two well-known people in the Bible, Abraham and Rahab. And you couldn't find two more different people in the Bible than those two people. Because Abraham was the father of the Jews. Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man. Rahab had been a sinful woman or a, a harlot. Abraham was a friend of God. Rahab had belonged to the enemies of God. So, what did they both have in common? They both exercised saving faith. The kind of faith that we have. Abraham uh, demonstrated his faith by his works in verse 20 through 24. But you are willing to recognize, you foolish spiritual shallow person, that without faith, good works, works is useless. Was our father Abraham not shown to be justified by works of obedience which express his faith when he offered Isaac his son on the altar as a sacrifice to God? You see that his faith was working together with his works. And as a result of his works, his faith was completed, reaching its maturity when he expressed his faith through obedience. 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and this faith was credited to him by God as righteousness and was conformity to his will, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man believed is justified by works and not by faith alone. That is, by acts of obedience, a born-again believer reveals his faith. Now, Rahab demonstrated her faith also by her works, in verse 25 and 26, in the same way, Ray, what, Ray, was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works too when she received the Hebrew spies as guests and protected them and sent them away to escape by a different route? For just as the human body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works of obedience is also dead. Now we learn from this passage that Faith without works is dead faith. That faith only, the only time that that phrase was found in the scripture can be, cannot justify one. A believer is not justified by works and not by faith alone. That is, by acts of obedience, a born again believer reveals his faith. That perfect faith, in verse 22, 
necessitates works. That perfect faith necessitates works. You see that his faith was working together with his works. And as a result of the works, his faith was completed, reaching its maturity when he expressed his faith through obedience. That was a perfect faith necessitated by works. So I'm going into conclusion now. It is important that each of us as professing Christians examine our heart and life and make sure that we possess true saving faith, which is a dynamic faith. We all know that Satan is a great deceiver and one of his Devices is what pastors tells us all the time, imitation. Imitation. He can come as an angel of light, imitating Christ. He's always trying to imitate God. Always. But that's okay. He can imitate, but he can't duplicate. That's okay. If he can convince us that counterfeit faith is true faith, then he has us in his power. So, what questions should we ask ourselves to examine our faith? One, was there a time when I honestly realized I was a sinner and admitted this to myself and to God? In other words, you came to the point, no, we came to the point where we found out that enough was enough. And we realized that we needed a Savior. And there's Jesus, our Savior, waiting on us to realize that. Was there a time when my heart stirred me to flee from the wrath to come? Have I ever been seriously worked up over my sins? If you've been seriously worked up over your sins, you know what I'm talking about. That goes right back to enough is enough. I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Do I, do I truly understand the gospel that Christ died for my sins and then rose again? Do I understand and confess that I cannot save myself? <laughs> wow, I laugh because some people really think they can save themselves, you know? Some people think that all they got to do is just be good and I'll save myself. Don't worry like that. If we could save ourselves, Christ died for nothing. We can't save ourselves. Did I sincerely repent of my sins, making the decision to turn from my sins? Do I hate sin and fear God? Or do I secretly love sin and want to enjoy it? Have I trusted Christ and him alone for my salvation by responding to the command he has given? Have I confessed my faith in Christ, then been baptized for the remission of my sins as he and his uh, apostles commanded? Have there been a change in my life? Do I maintain good works or do my works occasionally get weak? Do I seek and grow in the things of the Lord? Can others tell that I have been with Jesus or Jesus has been with me? Do I have a desire to share Christ with others or am I ashamed of, of Christ? Do I enjoy fellowship with God's people? Is worship a delight to me? Am I ready for the Lord's return? Or will I be ashamed when he comes for me? 
to be sure. Not every Christian has the same degree of faith. And we should all know that. Those who have had more time to grow should be stronger in their faith than a whole lot of others. God may be using each and every one of you in a different capacity that he's using me. But I can assure you one thing, he's using me. And he's using you. But for the most part, the spiritual inventory can consist, can assist us in determining our true standing before God. And may our prayer be similar to that of the psalmist, which says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And if there is any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. You can find that in Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. It's all about God through Christ Jesus. It ain't about us. When it becomes about us, we're gonna fail. As Pastor Bob said, we're going down. So, let us pray. Oh gracious God, Jesus is calling us right now, Father, to a new beginning. He's calling us to a new discipleship, Father. You are asking us, Father, to desire, uh, deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you. It was at our baptism, Father, that you claimed us as your children. Today, Father, we affirm that we have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. Father, we surrender our will, we surrender our desires, we surrender our life to you, O oh God. We commit ourselves to you. We submit ourselves to the call of discipleship. We submit ourselves, Father, to pray. We submit ourselves, Father, to study your word. We submit ourselves, Father, to worship you. Father, we submit ourselves to invite other people to the life of discipleship. Father, we submit ourselves to encourage Christians to their life of faith and serve those in need. Father, we give joyfully of the gifts that you have first given us. And Father, we just thank you right now that we can prosper as our soul prospers, Father. And we just give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, our Lord, our Savior, our God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. If not, Chuck, you going to close us out? Yes. <laughs> All right, like you said, we'll be up here. If you need prayer, come on up. And uh, search yourself about your faith, and then exercise your faith. you got to exercise to get stronger. So exercise.